in November 2005, TV presenter Ben Fogel and Olympic gold medalist James Cracknell set out on one of the world's toughest challenges to row 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean. Are we crazy? Half the stuff's outside, being swept overboard. They would face the worst weather the Atlantic could throw at them. We've come too far to go back. Their only protection, a tiny 24-foot rowing boat. The crossing would take two months and see Ben and James push to their absolute limits. We're gasping. Lack of food, lack of sleep. We follow their epic voyage with exclusive footage that captures their life-changing journey. Antigua, here we come! As they go through hell and high water. It's three weeks since Ben and James began their Atlantic crossing. And despite a bad start, they're now actually leading the race. We're in first place. Hurrah! But little do they know that disaster is about to strike. Oh. Tried everything. I'm kind of hallucinatory with them, um, with thirst. Oh, yeah, it's life threatening, isn't it? I love you. And they risk paying the ultimate price in their race to win. I thought the end of the world had come. It's December, and Ben and James are making good progress. They're rowing in shifts so that the boat is constantly moving. One rows for two hours while the other rests, and this continues 24 hours a day, every day. It's this grueling system that's been keeping them at the front of the pack. But their success in the race has exposed differences between the two rowers, and it's creating tension. What worries me the most about James is that he is a gold-winning Olympian and he is very much a, I don't just want to take part in this race, I want to beat the world record and I want to come first. We should maybe row a lot more than normal on the day before the wind comes. Yeah. That's how you win the races. Mm -hmm. Winning it has been so important to James and in a way that's just how He's coped with it. That's been his coping mechanism, is to focus on winning it. And he's, when he's had that goal in mind, he's been able, I think, to get through it. If he didn't have that, I don't think he'd know what to think about out there. You know, Ben said um, that James is very preoccupied about what Ben thinks about when he's actually rowing. And Ben, you know, and he always asks him, what, you, what do you think about, what do you think about? And Ben says, oh, I think about, you know, um, a week I spent in Devon with Marina or when I was on my gap year in South America or whatever. And he just daydreams. And, and then eventually Ben said to James, well, what do you think about? And James goes, winning. Well, what are you prepared to do to, to put us in a position to win? Well, what I'm doing now, which is kind of killing myself. But in addition to their personal differences, there's a much bigger problem developing, one that threatens to ruin their chances of reaching the finishing line at all. The machine that converts seawater into drinking water has ground to a halt, and despite their best efforts, they can't get it restarted. Losing water is potentially um, the worst thing that could happen. Well, yeah, it's life-threatening, isn't it? I mean, that's the, the bottom line is, you know, we're really, really thirsty now. I mean, I'm, I can't remember being this thirsty. It's just the one thing that you, you, you can't live without is water. And, uh, and that's all we've we'll been trying not only to live without it, but also race on it and row on it across the Atlantic. And it's just a nightmare. This should now start when I turn this switch. We were basically going thirsty. Up until then, we'd been drinking 30 litres a day, and suddenly we were down to just a, a couple of... We were, we were rationing maybe two litres a day each. We were cooking all our food in seawater, which was very salty, and, and that can't have been good for us, apart from just tasting disgusting. And, um, and we were psychologically and mentally just run down and exhausted. Despite the fact that they're not drinking nearly enough water, James is determined not to give up the lead. He insists that they continue to row hard. We rowed 12 hours a day on two and a half litres of water in 35 degrees, and it was, it was horrible. The lack of water puts Ben and James in a perilous position. It affects their minds, and they start losing control. 
even hallucinating. The things you're thinking about, things you're thinking about doing to yourself, the things that you think there's no way you're going to make it, things you, you'd rather be anywhere else, do anything to be anywhere else, that's been so tough. James is on the phone and desperately devastated, crying and just just desperate. I mean, when I put the phone down, I, I was actually quite worried about what he was going to do. I mean, he sounded like he was going to throw himself overboard, and that was a really anxious time. Dangerously dehydrated, they have to take drastic measures. The boat has an emergency supply of water that acts as ballast. But if they break into it, according to the race rules, they'll incur a time penalty. James is far from happy about it. That's when we reach the whole uh, perhaps big difference between James and I, and, um, and that is that I was, I took part in this race to do the crossing, whereas James took part in it to do the race. And by dipping into a, 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 that, that fresh water, we incurred a penalty, which for me didn't really matter, you know, as long as I got there. But James was um, much more adamant about leaving it till the last minute. We've tried everything. We've tried re rewiring the water maker. We've tried connecting to different batteries, swapping it over, and um, basically we're gasping. I'm kind of hallucinatory with, um, with thirst. So in here, this is a very dusty cupboard full of our ballast. So this is, um, this is basically the water that uh, is compulsory to take along to keep the integrity of the boat and for such an emergency. One each. Try and make it last 24 hours, something. With Christmas approaching, Ben and James's dream looks in tatters. Their only hope of carrying on in the race is if they can fix the water maker. With one last desperate roll of the dice, they bypass all the boat's electrics and hook up the battery directly to the solar panels that provide their power. Looks very complicated back there. It does look very complicated back there, doesn't it? Then it's a waiting game. 36 hours to see if it will charge. It will be Christmas Day before they can try it again. Here's the strangest place I've ever spent Christmas. Middle of the Atlantic, you know, thousands of miles of ocean all around me. Kind of as far from home and family and friends as I could be. Unfortunately, with our electrics all down, the one thing we do still have is a little special charger for the phone. So that's sucking up the sun's rays, unlike our solar cells, or hopefully, well, we'll find that later. Anyway, so it's the Christmas call, and um, I'm longing to call home, but I will admit that I'm a bit nervous. I, don't, I hope I don't get kind of emotional. I can't really explain my emotions on here. They're just kind of... They just sort of happen. You see, I feel fine now. And I'm a grown man. <laughs> grown men don't cry. So hopefully I won't. Hi, Mum. Merry Christmas. How are you? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and open them in a minute. OK. I love you. Hi, Dad. How are you? Sorry. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, no, it's good. It's fine. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. How are you all there? Okay. Love you, Mum. Bye. Bye. Thousands of miles from their loved ones and tormented by thirst, Ben and James try their best to celebrate Christmas. But they're in a fragile state. Hooray! Christmas, James. Yeah, man. Christmas. That's the best Christmas is Scrooge. <laughs> this is our Christmas. How long can we have how, how long can we have to sit here and just sit and be? James has allowed them a two-hour break from rowing to mark the occasion. I never thought on Christmas Day I'd be have water as my highest wish on the list. Oh, James, man. Row your own rough duck. 
<laughs> in 72 hours. All you have to do, <laughs> put it in water. <laughs> what, what have we got? None of water. The one. Ben calls his girlfriend, Marina. Hello. Happy Christmas, darling. I just tried calling you. Oh, how are you? OK. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, we have. I didn't expect the phone call on Christmas Day, and I just thought, oh, my God, what's wrong? And it was when they didn't have any water, and Ben just... Which is very rare for Ben, you know, he just said, I, I can't go on. So, so depressing, and I did my best to keep his hopes up. And I think they were slightly delirious from lack of water. Then it's James's turn to call his wife, Bev. How's the little soldier? He just sounded little out in the middle of the ocean, just sounded sort of small and tiny and helpless, and that's not a side of James you ever see. And to hear him cry so often, I mean, he's cried on most of the phone calls, sobbed, that's unheard of. No one said the rowing that rowing the Atlantic was going to be easy, but I, I had no idea how hard it was going to be. Ben and James spend the whole of Christmas Day praying that the water maker's battery is charging. It's an agonizing wait, but finally the moment of truth arrives. If the water maker fails now, their dreams of crossing the Atlantic are over. What's happening, James? It's pretty much the defining moment of the trip so far. We've let the solar panels charge the battery, one battery for two days. We're gonna start it and hopefully produce enough water to live on. To be honest, this is the biggest wait for a Christmas present I've ever had. You know, this is the most important thing today. I'll turn the stop cock on. It's on. Oh, Christmas Day is really only one thing you can do to, to celebrate. And let's just go. We have water! Water! We have water! We were so happy. Oh, we were so happy. I just remember James just jumping into the water. And it suddenly seemed like Antigua was in our grasp again. I feel amazing! I want to get it all out of my system! We have water! <laughs> oh, Benny boy. Game on, man, game on. We're back in the loop. Back in action. Mm -hmm. Benny boy. Water. You, you mm -hmm. row, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you a cocktail. Mm, a water cocktail. Can it please <laughs> come with some water? Yes. Uh, with a little drop of water, <laughs> and then a little drop of water on that, and, um, and topped off with an ice cube that we can't possibly have. No. Oh, James, I'm so happy. Yeah, that's no, the best just Christmas couldn't. present I've ever, ever had. Oh, Ben, man, that was so nice. Stress relief. That's the best Christmas present ever. Despite all the festive cheer, James still has his eye on the prize. It may be Christmas Day, but that's no excuse for not rowing. <sighs> OK, oh, yeah, I'm so happy. back on your seat. Look <laughs> at you, you, slave driver. Wait, you want to get to Antigua? I'm so happy. Ooh, I'm so go happy. Go so man. We're, we're winning the race, still. Oh. Water, water, water. Water, water, water. With their thirsts well and truly quenched, the race begins again in earnest. and James won't let anything slow them down, not even the sea life. Tiny barnacles have attached themselves to the hull of the boat, and he's convinced they'll create drag in the water. Just excuse the nappy rash. Be very careful, James, please, yeah? Do you, sure, you don't, do you, should you not put a line on you? Oh, mate, I'm only, only going one knot. I'm only going down there to check the bottom of the boat. You watch me where you're panning that camera. OK, but James, please, I, I am a bit nervous about I'm you mate, going I'm, in. I'm going to flop over the side. 
I'm out of here. <laughs> Any idea of the depth? No, deeper than six foot four. About 6,400. Oh. Long way down. But leaving the boat is a risk. One of the other boats in the race has already been attacked by a shark. The threat is very real. Not only that, but the rough seas threaten to sweep James away. How is it? Very salty. I'm suddenly very scared. I'm scared of sharks all of a sudden. Oh, what's the big wave? Please hold on tightly, James, yeah? Despite the dangers, James survives. And while he's been risking life and limb underwater, Ben's been dedicating himself to more domestic duties. Can you fill up my uh, Lugazet bottle with water? Your Lugazet is done. Is it? Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been an excellent housewife. Does Ben fill your, your water bottle? <laughs> I, I guess I clean the car, you can do the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says about each of our characters, James. I've even cleaned your spoon. Yeah. But James's need for speed is getting Ben down. It all comes back to this race thing, doesn't it? Which is kind of doing my head in more than ever. But, you know, we're racing, 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 racing. I just want to cross. We were called up by the race organisers yesterday to say that when Sula, the support yacht, visited us a few days ago, she took a picture and saw that we were drying a pair of pants from from one of the the mast, the, the running lights or something. And, um, and we were told that that could increase our speed and to remove them at once. And... Uh, <laughs> Hello? A pair of pants. How do you dry stuff? Apparently they were acting like a sail. You know, all this is just building, building, building. And all I just want to, I just want to hug. But there is the odd distraction from the race. They may be 1,500 miles from the nearest land, but they're not alone. Cool. They're sharing the same course as a whale. No, you can't, James. Not long now. <laughs> There's loads around there. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Coming under the leaf. You see it? Look, James. See the blue? It's coming underneath us. Look at it. Oh my God! Look at the size of it. <laughs> Whoa, man! Whoa! Look at him! That is an enormous whale. Kind of swept like a, a sort of torpedo or, or submarine underneath us, way bigger than we are, and just swept underneath, which was, I mean, it was magical, I have to say. It was a magical, it wasn't scary because it could have easily tipped us. It was much bigger than us. I'd just say it was just an amazing, amazing sight. But the happiness is short-lived. The winds turn against them yet again and stop them dead in their tracks. No matter how hard they row, they just can't make any progress. But not all the race competitors are experiencing the same conditions. And while Ben and James stand still, the others are catching up. So you've been enjoying it, James? I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying it today, no. So I get on with it. You can't do anything that uh, yourself really. Like if it's windy like this, you just, you just can't really move into it, and you then not everyone has the same conditions, which really annoys me. Which when the weather was against us, it just drove him utterly crazy. If we could, because he, could, you know, he, he's from a world of sport where most things are. Controllable. As long as you can, as long as you are the fittest man in the world, in, in, you are one of the best rowers. Given that calm water and that boat, you can do it. And we've worked really hard to get in a, in a good position at the front, and 
and now you get this. And it happened last time we got to the front and then we got bad wind again, but it's just starts to get on top of you after a while. And uh, yeah, it's going to be down a bit today. The Olympics, if it gets windy, they stop it. If it's unfair, they stop it. Whereas for us, I can get over the fact that if we had bad wind, someone else 200 miles north had great wind and took 100 miles off us in a day. And I'm going, that's clearly not fair. You know, that's, everyone should have to stop at the same time. There's all these things that I couldn't get my head around. <laughs> Stupid idea was this. Hate me. I do hate you right now. I hate everybody right now. Full of hate. Started ranting like a madman, throwing oars around, screaming, um, rowing just like, like a man possessed. It was incredible. And um, I did have to kind of hide myself in the cabin and, and just kind of steer clear of him because I, I knew that, that he, he was ready to just absolutely blow. He has sort of been struggling a bit, to say the least, which kind of <laughs> means that the other person on the boat ends, ends up suffering a bit as well. Get me to Antigua, please. OK. If I'd been in the cabin and I had been a bit upset, quite upset. I had, I had been crying, in fact. But I was so upset, I just thought I had to admit to him, or, or just I wanted him to know that I was feeling down. So I said, listen, James, I'm having a really, really low day. And he was like, OK. Um, so I got onto the oars and um, rode my session. And about halfway through, he said, Ben, can I ask you a question? He said, um, do you really care about this race? Because you're not sweating, and I, do, I just don't think you're putting any effort into it. And my, I, I, just, I just, I was just incredulous. It's just like, I've just told him I'm having a really low day and I'm, I'm really rowing hard here. And you're asking me why I'm not sweating. <laughs> At times, some things that were meant to be quite sensitive and helpful came across really badly. Um, combined with Ben, who um, is probably a bit sensitive, I would say. He, he's got, had things his own way quite a lot in his life and uh, doesn't particularly like being told what to do or people being a bit straight with him. Um, so it took him a while to realise that I was just being saying what I thought rather than being vindictive or nasty. I'm sure there were things that annoyed him about me, and there were definitely things that that me. Ben still didn't really mind whether we won or lost for a lot of the race, but he wanted to get there as quick as possible. So effectively, that amounts to the same thing. And we tried, and I tried especially to use his motivation to get there quickly to, to push us hard. As Ben becomes more resigned to the idea of racing, his morale begins to lift. And for once, the weather starts to lend them a helping hand. Good win today then, Ben. Oh, this is what we've been waiting for. All those days of longing for the so-called northeasterlies and easterlies, and finally, it's here. So there's quite a swell, actually. And finally, we're actually making like, really good headway. When I say really good, how many miles did we do that you're being knocked all over the place? How many miles was it yesterday? Uh, 80? Yeah. 80 miles. I mean, there's been whole weeks when we haven't done that. The strong tailwind and the big waves push them ever faster. It feels like we're going to do it, which is amazing. It's the first, I think it's the first few days when James and I are really starting to enjoy it and, and realising, you know, that we can do this, and we can do it well. Oh, there we go. What speed's that, James? Five knots. Five knots! <laughs> now, I don't like to count my chickens before they're hatched, but I have to say today is a very good day. I have a big smile on my face for the first time. But the strong winds get stronger, and the big waves get bigger. Ben and James are about to face the biggest challenge of the trip. Little did they know that their very lives hung in the balance. It was, it was a, rough, a rough night, but a very fast night for us. We'd been blown in the right direction, but there were big waves. I was in the cabin and Ben was rowing. And it was just as he's sort of doing the first day shift, sort of, sort of seven, eight o'clock in the morning. I just looked up and just saw this enormous, enormous wave. I thought the end of the world had come. The next thing I know, um, 
Just, I just feel it here and feel a crash at the same time. Ding, ding, ding. All I remember was just feeling a torrent of water hitting me. The giant wave flips the boat end over end, a complete capsize. I just remember being underwater, just holding on to an oar, feeling my feet slip from my shoes. No, no other thoughts to that. That's all I remember, just holding on to, to one of the oars, then the oar slipping from my hand and just being underwater and just not knowing which way was up and down. I kind of wake up with my face pressed against the skylight of the, of the cabin and, uh, and I can hear loads of water coming in the other, through the door. I burst out of the water. And there was the boat capsized, a black hull, um, uh, just sticking out of the water. All I was thinking about was, where the hell is James? Why is he not up yet? Why, why, why is he not out of the cabin? And to I'm disoriented. My first thing is, oh my god, the boat's broken. You know, there I was, 700 miles from anywhere, in an enormous ocean, 25-foot waves, 100 feet away from a boat upturn. And I, I just went into, I went into shock there and then. I remember stumbling out to try and look for Ben, because. I realised we'd been upside down, didn't know where he was, and I'd come out on deck and all the stuff that's sat on our deck, water bottles, thermos flasks, um, our big water tank, all that was in the sea just drifting away and no sign of Ben. And I was like, I grabbed the throne line, I was shouting for him, shouting for him. I just saw James's face peering over, looking around, just like a, like a rabbit. And I just said, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You know, just that, I just remember that, just, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Down the cabin is underwater. Half the stuff's outside. It's been been, uh, been swept overboard. Very scary, and Ben's very shaken. As am I. The capsize has destroyed all the boat's electrics. Much of their equipment has been swept away for good, and Ben is in a state of shock. But with over 700 miles to go to the finish line, can they pull themselves back from the brink? Both physically, <laughs> stupid idea was it, and mentally. I'm losing it. I'm losing my marbles. Can they finally end their battle with the Atlantic Ocean? <laughs>